bit smaller. Okay, call the meeting to order, 7 o'clock. Welcome everyone here this evening, as scattered as you are. We're all here. So it's good to see you. Uh, before we really get into the meat of it, we have actually five hearings. Uh, Mike has some protocol to cover so that we understand exactly what's happening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the board, uh, members of the planning board. Um, one of the things that's a little different tonight with tonight's joint public hearing is you notice there's probably uh, several steps that you haven't had to take previously when entering the building. In addition to having your temperature checked, there was a series of questions that were asked um, as part of a health screening when you walked in just to make sure that um, everybody's feeling well. Additionally, you'll notice everybody's very spread out, including the planning board and the applicant, as well as any public that are going to be here tonight. Um, we made sure that everybody is able to social distance, um, but we do ask that for those who are in the crowd or in the, um, uh, the audience seats tonight, if possible, to keep your mask on unless you're presenting into your microphone, just in case somebody does have to walk by you and it, we're not able to meet the social distancing requirement at that point in time. <clears throat> One thing you're also going to see tonight is each um, agenda item is going to have a rotation that will occur. The back several rows, with the exception of a couple for staff right now, are uh, accommodated for the applicant as well as public that would like to speak. We're going to be rotating in the applicant as well as any, as well as any public to make sure that everybody has an opportunity for that agenda item to participate entirely within the, uh, within the room. Um, there's a, one agenda item that we're going to have to rotate some of the public in, but we're making, uh, making efforts to accommodate that. So there will be a brief period after each agenda item um, when we'll escort those, uh, the applicant out and then bring the next applicant in. With that, does anybody have any questions? All right, perfect. Okay, thank you. All right, well, the first hearing is on the Wake County Historic Landmark designation of uh, request from Capital Area Preservation for 216 West Gannon. Mike, you want to introduce our speaker? Yes. Um, as you know, with uh, one of the items in the 2030 strategic plan um, deals with small town, town life, um, and part of that is making sure we preserve the heritage that we have. Um, an important component of that is preserving some of the historic structures um, as well as the stories behind those structures um, within the town. Tonight we have Jeremy Bradham uh, from Capital Area Preservation who is going to be providing a presentation on an application and request to designate um, uh, the uh, Barbie House at 216 West Gannon as a Wake County Historic Landmark. Um, to preface this, one thing that's important to note is the town of Zedlin does not have a historic district, but we do currently have two and potentially three historic landmarks that are, regula or that are um, regulated under the Wake County Historic Preservation um, Commission, and Cap Area Preservation provides um, staffing assistance to them. Um, this does not create a Historic Preservation Commission for the town, um, but we utilize the services of Wake County and Cap to provide those services for us. With that, I'll introduce Jeremy Bradham from Capital Area Preservation. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Board of Commissioners. Uh, my name is Jeremy Bradham, as, as Mike mentioned, uh, and I'll be presenting uh, the request to designate the Georgia Neva uh, uh, Barbie House as a Zebulon Historic Landmark. So the house is located at 216 West Gannon Street. The owners are Todd and Margaret Gekowicz. I hope I got that right because I've met them a couple times and I still, I still got it wrong, didn't I? You did. Yeah, <laughs> I butchered it, but close enough. Um, the lot is 100 foot wide by 235 feet deep and the house sits 55 feet back on the property and you'll see its location there on West Gannon. Um, the proposed boundary for the landmark designation here in Zebulon does encompass the entire house parcel itself. Um, but it does have the house and then the garage there to the back and then a small contributing structure that shares the border with another property as well. Uh, the George Sprite Neva Fowers Barbie House was likely built around um, late 1914. The Barbies acquired the property in October of that year. Zebulon was still in its infancy in its first decade of being incorporated. 
Um, George Bright Barbie was originally a Morrisville native, and he moved to Zebulon around 1912, sometime after earning his degree of, uh, in medicine from the University of North Carolina. Once he completed his studies in May 1910, he had two years of hospital work in Raleigh and became a licensed physician later that year. Two days later, in May of 1912, Barbie appeared to be officially living here in Zebulon. Uh, he served as a judge at a debate that was actually part of the commencement activities for this school right here. Uh, in 1913, uh, the North Carolina Yearbook and Business Directory lists him for the very first time as a physician here in Zebulon. Uh, George, Barbie, uh, and Eva Flowers were married on October 22, 1913. Uh, the following October, uh, they, uh, George Flowers divided an acre purchased from Dr. Cavanis into two parcels. Um, one was conveyed for two sisters. This was um, the one we'll be discussing today. Um, the sisters built houses of similar scale and massing, imposing four squares with deep box eaves, broad porches. Um, but this particular brick dwelling um, was very imposing. As a matter of fact, I do want to mention also, this is the only individually privately owned property that is a nat um, on, listed individually on the National Register of Historic Places here in Zebulon. The other National Register of Historic Places property is the building we're in right now. So just an interesting fact. Um, so the Barbie, was the Barbie house was actually home to only two families throughout the 20th century, uh, the Barbies and the Masseys. Um, in 1956, it was sold to the Masseys and they owned it through the 1990s. Fast forward, there was a renovation in 2010 to the house. And then the current owners purchased, I'm not gonna try and butcher their name again, but in August of 2019, and um, it did undergo some um, renovation and restoration work in that 2010 time period. Um, and some of that will be reflected in the pictures. So I'm gonna give a little description of the house. It's a two-story, on raised basement, brick-clad, modified craftsman four-square with some colonial revival and prairie-style elements throughout. It's got a symmetrical uh, facade, three bays wide. Has a single-story wraparound front porch with a port cochere on the left side, as you see right there. Um, there's a Palladian arrangement uh, in the vents. And um, I don't want to bore you all with too much with the architecture description, but it does have red-laid brick running bond. It clads the exterior walls and is continuous from the foundation all the way to the top. There are two brick chimneys with corbel caps that rise through the slide slopes of the hip slide, excuse me, the side slopes of the hip roof, and a third chimney with plain limestone cap rises from the back slope of the hip roof with a small single story, story rear wing that houses the kitchen and enclosed back porch. There's a cast iron stair on the rear as well, as you'll see with a basement that goes down to a cellar. Uh, this particular facade right here um, features a unique window that's not found throughout. Um, it's got a, uh, generally speaking, it's 12 over one sash, so you have 12 panes over one pane of glass, which is pretty popular with the Craftsman style, but this side has this prairie style window right here, um, and it's actually nine over one, and we think it was added a little bit later, but uh, it is indicative of that prairie style, which there's nothing else like that uh, here in Zebulon. Um, so the flanking windows are a little bit taller in, in this as well, but those are solid stone lentils as well throughout at each one of those windows. Uh, the front porch itself features a solid brick balustrade wall, which was a popular craftsman porch. Got three rectangular openings in each bay between the porch columns. Um, and they also have thick limestone sills to match all of the windows as well. Just to give you an idea of the floor plan before we go through a few interior pictures. Um, it's a modified four square plan, which you could have really seen in any Sears and Roebuck type magazine at the time. You could order it, it would arrive on the railroad and you could place that kit together. Um, so uh, the inset rear section houses a butler pantry, bathroom, and a closet um, at the first floor with closets, bathroom, and a stair landing on the second. Um, there are really only a few modifications, and that was two new bathrooms installed on the second story um, in one of the bedrooms in 2010. Whoa, that went forward. Sorry. All right, so this is your front entry hallway right here, just showing... Um, a period mantle that was placed there and some, um, and some moldings that were replicated based on the originals. Um, is, you know, obviously houses change over time, but that 2010 renovation was to try and get it back to that original appearance. Um, the Colonial Revival mantle you see there has got nice Tuscan columns with an over mantle, a brick firebox and a hearth. It's roughly centered on the wall, so, um, and it carries through to the other room as well, and you'll see that uh, here in a second. But across through those uh, French doors right there, is one of the original craftsman style brick mantles, which are very indicative of the 19 teens. Um, and you've got another pair of French doors that leads you into this room right here. And this is your dining room area. And the molding above is actually what was added in that 2010 date. 
In the back part of the dining room, uh, it's got beaded ceiling, craftsman style wainscoting, um, and it's got that Colonial Revival mantle in there. So you've got both Colonial Revival and Craftsman as well. There's another shot of, of that uh, living room area. And there are Butler's Pantry right there, just so you don't get a good idea of the interior details that are still intact. Just briefly on the second story, it's got a bedroom in each of the four corners. Um, closets or portion of the closets, have, like I said, have been converted into bathrooms, but most of the original material remains intact. And everything mimics those simple mantles on the first floor, your craftsman um, mantles thrown in with your fireboxes in the corner of the room. Uh, perhaps one of the more significant uh, features of the property is actually this simple well house that was constructed at the time of the house. Remember I mentioned that there were two houses um, built by, for two sisters and uh, this is actually where the two sisters, you know, it's anecdotal, but they would gather and they would meet and talk to one another. And this is why this literally straddles the, the property line, but it is a contributing structure. Um, it's re relatively good in integrity and everything, and it's uh, important to the overall character of the historic house. And then you've got a garage that was built around that same time in 1914, but it's not contributing to the landmark itself. Um, it'll be inco inco incorporated into the boundary if you were to um, vote on that today or when, when you vote on it, but uh, it's been modified too much to uh, be a contributing structure. So with the significant statement, um, the Barbie house embodies distinctive characteristics of an early 20th century craftsman four-square dwelling with an eclectic use of some colonial revival and prairie-style architectural details. The house is a notable example of its type and style, possessing high artistic values compared to others in town and in the county. The craftsman style masonry four-square is relatively rare in the county, and the Barbie house is Zebulon's only example. Both the material and the size of the dwelling give it a grand presence on West Gannon Street. Uh, and here to uh, present uh, the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission recommendation is our Vice Chair, uh, Jeff Hastings. Jeff, if you don't mind. I don't gotta do that, but so you can officially give that. Mayor, Council. Um, Staff recommends that the Zebulon Board Commissioners designate the George and Neva Barbie House located at 216 West Gannon Street, Zebulon, as a Zebulon Historic Landmark and adopt the associated ordinance. <laughs> Last slide. And then um, the commission recommendation. Um, at its meeting on March 10, 2020, the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission unanimously did recommend um, that the Zebulon Board of Commissioners designate the George and Eva Barbie House as a Zebulon Historic Landmark and adopt the associated ordinance. And uh, that is it. Okay. Questions? Questions? <clears throat> yes, not. Thank you. Yes, thank Anyone you. else wishing to speak on this issue? Okay. Well, the. Um, Right, then we'll refer the matter to the planning board for their review and final recommendation to come back to us. That's correct. This will be on your September agenda for your regular meeting for decision. And the associated ordinance, as referenced, will be on that agenda packet as well. All right. Okay. Uh, let's go to CZ 2020-01, Five County Mini Storage. Staff report. I'm sorry, it's just a tender. I know. Thank you. Good evening. CZ 2021, five county mini storage. The applicant is John Sikorsky. The site's located at 1420 Old US Highway 264. The existing zoning is light industrial. Parcel size is two parcels, which are a total of 2.31 acres. The request before you today is a conditional zoning from light industrial to light industrial conditional zoning. This is a, oops, sorry, this is a vicinity map. Parcels highlighted in yellow, located on old US Highway 264, just west of the intersection of North Carolina Highway 39. There is an existing storage facility on site. You have um, warehouses to the adjacent east and to the adjacent west. 
current zoning in the area, light industrial to the adjacent east, and then heavy industrial to the adjacent west. These are pictures of uh, the posted sign. This is looking on um, one of the parcels eastbound. This is on the western parcel looking westbound. This is the existing storage facility. This is the adjacent warehouse to the east. And this is the adjacent warehouse to the west. Two conditions are applied to the parcel. The first condition is allowing a self-storage facility on a minimum site size of two acres, and then a type A landscape buffer to be planted along the western property line. This is the concept plan submitted by the applicant. The majority of the, the self-storage facilities are 5,500 square feet. What he wants to do is propose an expansion in the areas highlighted in red, roughly about 1,200 square feet. The reason for the rezoning request is when the UDO was adopted, uh, self-storage facilities had to be on a, a minimum site size of five acres. Um, so the existing site is a non-conforming, excuse me, a non-conforming use. <clears throat> And that concludes my presentation. I'll answer your questions. Questions? So this is right on what might at some point be considered a way to get to Mudcat Stadium. Correct. So is there, uh, will there be room for a sidewalk should the town ever require one? And if so, um, is that something that we need to consider? Not with the modification that he wants to do. Um, because it's just it's a small expansion if this was to develop where technical review committee would be required then there's a possibility that we could get right away and um, sidewalk improvements okay thank you well, where he wants to build is on the back side right that's correct the south side yeah okay. I just want to be sure I was looking at it correct he wants okay. to he wants to develop <coughs> This, yeah. this area right here. Okay. Me, All right, I, just want to be clear. All right, thanks. Me, I, got, question? I got a question. So when you look at that site plan, it's listing the impervious percentage of almost 75%. Correct. But per the UDO, your maximum coverage can only be 65% per that use. So would he be required to then come back for a variance or are you going to toss that into here? He's been in discussions with Wake County Soil and Erosion Control. Okay. Um, I'll let him, I'll let the applicant elaborate on the conversations he had with the, their employees. But um, from what I've been told, he's, he's, um, got, he's gained an, ex excuse me, an exemption. For, for the county, but what about for the Zebulon UDO? Because per that use type, there's a coverage percentage maximum. And this would be over it. And I'm just asking if, if this would require a variance in addition to this conditional use. It would be my opinion that um, we would defer to Lake County. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. Uh, anyone then wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Ralph, that's you. If anyone would like me to answer any questions, I'd be happy to. Well, you need to come to the podium, Mr. Dorsey. I, I just, if you don't have anything to say, that's fine, but we'll ask them if they have any questions, okay? Okay. Um, in light of this gentleman's question. Excuse me, can you just state your name right. for the record? Uh, my name is John Sikorsky. S-I-K-O-R-S-K-I, -S if you need that. Um, I spoke with Barney Stormwater Runoff, and he has said, based on what you have built and the way you built it, that he would exempt our facility uh, for adding 2,500 square feet of buildings, 20, uh, 50 feet by 25 twice, plus the required uh, acres around. Thank you. Now, let's see if anybody has a question for you. Any questions? So you're going to be installing additional landscape buffer? I would, yes. Okay. Okay. I sort of say yes. 
whatever you guys within reason. Okay. Thank you. I'm not. That's just how I think. I, you know, and you know, look, little old Zebulon's growing nicely. So. Okay. Any thank other you. questions? And thank you, John. Thank you. All right. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and refer that matter to the planning board for their recommendation. And now we'll open CZ 2020-02, 1500 to, and 1512 North Arundel Avenue. CZ 2022, 1500 and 1512 North Rendell Avenue. The applicant is Clyde Holt. Parcel size is approximately 2.7 acres. The existing zoning is residential two. The request before you tonight is a conditional zoning request from residential two to heavy commercial uh, conditional zoning. This is a, the vicinity map located on North Rendell in between the inter intersections of uh, Green Pace and the intersection with 64, U.S. Highway 64. Uh, two parcels are uh, requested to rezoning. One is currently developed as a retail use, uh, uh, um, an auto sales lot, and the northern parcel is currently vacant. You have some retail across North Rendell Avenue, um, some retail to the adjacent uh, southeast and then you have single family attached dwellings to, to the east. Uh, there's a church use to the adjacent north. The zoning in the area uh, to the north, you have residential two, you have residential multifamily to the east, heavy commercial to the southeast, um, heavy commercial across the street, and then also across the street, you have some light industrial. Uh, future land use map uh, recognizes this area as mixed use. This is a picture of the, the posted sign looking northbound on North Arundel. Uh, this is another property being posted uh, looking southbound on North Arundel. This is looking at the adjacent church facility and the, uh, vac the vacant subject site. This is the existing auto sales lot on the southern lot that's um, requesting the rezoning change. This is um, a portion of that vacant lot and the uh, existing lot looking at the, uh, the uh, townhomes to the adjacent east. This is a concept plan that was submitted by the applicant. Uh, the proposed tentative use would be uh, a, a drive-through retail establishment with two access points, one on North Arundel and then there's another access point that would be a shared access with the uh, uh, lot to the adjacent south. Um, you'll see uh, with the proposed zoning conditions, they are uh, constructing a fence along the adjacent property lines of the single family attached and the, and the church facility. Uh, three zoning conditions placed on the property. Whatever building is uh, proposed will not exceed 35 feet in height. When the project comes in for technical review committee, a traffic impact analysis uh, will have to be submitted and approved by the town of Zebulon. And the third is the, the construction of the fence that, that I just mentioned. With the rezoning request, all uses allowed in the heavy commercial district would be allowed, except for these eight, an ABC store, a bottle shop, a flea market, a golf course or driving range, a microbrewery, micro winery, micro distillery, nightclub, dance hall, tattoo and piercing establishment, and a truck stop. And then uh, in a separate action, the applicant's requesting that, uh, that the administrative conditional zoning fee be waived. Uh, this parcel was, uh, prior to the EDO being uh, adopted, was zoned heavy business and uh, approximately 2015 uh, came through with a rezoning request to get the property zoned <coughs> heavy business. Um, available for any questions. Okay, I want to be real clear. We're talking about both parcels, is that right? That's correct. And 
your last statement, I'm, I'm sorry I'm having a little difficulty hearing, uh, is that it was zone heavy business and when we adopted the UDO, we changed it. To residential two. That's correct. Input from the owner. Okay, thank you. I just want to be clear on that. And, and just to elaborate, that concept plan that was submitted, that's only for the northern parcel, the vacant parcel. That, that concept plan doesn't apply to the, the auto sales lot that's currently developed. Okay. Yeah, that, I think why I was asking the question because I got a little confused about that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you please uh, elaborate more on where exactly the fence is going to be? So the condition is on the property lines adjacent with residential dwelling units and the church property. So that would be this property line right here, and this property line right here. Those property lines. Just where the church, if I can go to the vicinity map. All right, so we construct along right here. That that's where a fence is going to go, next to those, in the brown. Right on the on the on the subject property adjacent to where these uh, where the townhomes are, and then on along the church property. Okay. The church is located right here to the north. Okay. <coughs> Do we know? So it was rezoned from what originally from in 2015. What was its original zoning? Prior, prior to that? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know if the applicant can shed light on that. I guess, so I was just wondering if the conditions that were established at that time have been met for that prior zoning, if we're going to add new zoning conditions on top of that, or have they already completed all those conditional requirements? Prior to the UDO, we didn't have conditional zoning. So okay. it would have just been a, a, a zoning map amendment without conditions on it. Gotcha. It would have to meet the code of ordinances. Gotcha. Okay. Other questions? Prior to the UDO being adopted, there was a notice for the public to review the UDO and to contact the town with questions and concerns. That's correct. Thank you. In, in just a second, the, the, the public will have an opportunity in, in just a moment. Okay. Any other questions? Me uh, the board. Yeah, so I got an additional. Um, the concerns of the neighbors from the neighboring uh, housing townhomes or whatnot, um, I saw that they had kind of been concerned with pollution, whether it be from lights, sounds, activity, trash. Um, has there been any investigation on limiting the use of certain types of lights in that new development so that there's not light, light pollution going back into those townhomes? There's not a light restriction. They would, they'd be allowed to uh, construct what the UDL allows. Okay. Any more? Any more questions? I saw some concerns um, regarding the um, buffer from the um, president of the Residents Association for Wedgwood? Whatever, I'm sorry, whatever the, I'm sorry? Lakeland. Yes. The one that, that adjoins, that's the brown property from the picture. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and so, where were they hoping for, um, um, have they reached out and talked to you then so that you have an understanding of where they are talking about offense? I would, I would let the, the applicant or the, the, the property owners speak. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. All right, uh, anyone wishing to speak in favor of the uh, Oh. 
Good evening. I'm Clyde Holt. Uh, I'm with the Fox Rothschild Law Firm in Raleigh, as is my uh, associate, uh, Ashley Terrazas. Uh, we're here speaking on behalf of the property owner, Tommy Perry. May I remove this? Yes, sir. Thank you. The, um, we're here tonight asking to that you, that you recommend and support remedying what we consider to be a mistake in your recent adoption of the UDO and the rezoning process. The story starts in 2008 with the town board's adoption of your current comprehensive plan. Yeah, Mead, if you'll put that first slide that we gave you, not that one, but the next one, and that's the only one I think I need to show, uh, this one. This shows the commercial corridor of Arundel Avenue uh, between the bypass, the interchange of the bypass as you proceed uh, north and west away from town. Uh, it illustrates the commercial activity and the rapid, the rapid expansion of that commercial activity along the corridor. Uh, prior to the adoption of your comprehensive plan in 2008 and certainly since then, your comp plan recognized that this was no longer a residential area and re recommended commercial zoning on all of the frontage along uh, the highway. You'll see with uh, no exceptions between the interchange and our property, it was all rezoned either to industrial or to the heavy business district. That was the recommendation based upon the comprehensive plan recommendation, and that is still the recommendation, by the way, it hasn't changed. There's no comprehensive plan recommendation for residential zoning on this property. But in reliance upon that comprehensive plan uh, recommendation, Mr. Perry, our client, purchased the property as an investment. And then uh, in 2015, requested that it be rezoned to the plan recommendation highway business district. Um, the next step of the story is uh, the adoption of your UDO, uh, its consideration in the fall of uh, 2019 and its effective date on January 1st. And that UDO adoption um, did away with all your formal zoning classifications, as you know, and came up with a new list of commercial activities commercial zoning districts, residential zoning districts. And that's quite often the case when a municipality enacts an updated and new regulation. But the common practice is to take the look at the property that was zoned prior to the new UDO and to attempt to match up the district with the district which is closest under the new plan. In other words, property that is zoned industrial under the old classifications. You look at an industrial classification that closely resembles the old and you switch it from one type of industrial to the other. Same thing with residential. You take residential property and choose which residential classification most closely resembles the former one. Same thing with retail and so on. But that didn't happen here. The town instead, and for reasons which we don't understand, and again, despite the comprehensive plan recommendation that this be zoned for commercial use, down zoned this to R2, a classification which allows detached single family residences across from Bojangles, next to the ABC store, across from the bank processing center that for reasons, and again, unexplained, it was down zone to R2. The question was asked, wasn't there a notice posted? Well, when a new UDO is adopted, quite often you're doing away with all your zoning districts and you're coming up with new districts. It's a massive rezoning effort. And the law in such a case does not require personal notice to every property owner. And so Mr. Perry received no personal notice. Yes, there was a notification of a new UDO, but we would suggest that there was a greater obligation than the, than the minimum the law allows when you are down zoning somebody's property 
from heavy business to single family detached residential. There was no notice given in this particular instance. The first time Mr. Perry heard about this was when a prospective buyer of the property contacted the town staff about prospective commercial use on the business zoned lot. The prospective purchaser comes back to Mr. Perry and says, your lot's zoned for single family homes. Mr. Perry goes down and talks with the staff and finds sympathy with the staff, but not an explanation as to how or why this property was singled out for single family home zoning on this commercial corridor. Staff did suggest that whether it was a mistake or not, that the best way to remedy it, the practical way to remedy it for was for Mr. Perry to file a new rezoning district to return it to the commercial classification which most closely resembled the heavy business zoning that existed before. That is what we have done and that is why we are here. We held a neighborhood meeting um, for the property uh, back in May and uh, we've had several good discussions with adjacent property owners uh, since that time. Um, there has been a good dialogue uh, regarding possible uses and also uh, possible conditions which we could attach to the case to make it um, palatable as far as our adjacent property owners, both commercial owners as well as residential owners as well as the Baptist Church. Uh, we have added numerous conditions to the case, some of which were summarized by uh, me. Thank you, sir. But I'd like to go into greater detail because he did not mention all of the conditions. And it's important for our neighbors to know that we have come forward and included conditions that we talked to them about, some of which they asked for. So first, uh, as Mead explained, we have eliminated certain uses which either the church or the neighbors might find objectionable, such as a tattoo parlor, such as a uh, flea market would be open on Sundays, a variety of uses we have eliminated. Further, we have added conditions that would apply towards any new construction on the property. Uh, specifically, there is a 35-foot building height limitation. Hours of trash collection have been limited. Apparently, there has been some problem with the uh, other commercial uses that border the townhouses as opposed to picking up trash uh, other than do during normal working hours. And so that condition has been added. Exterior lighting must be aimed and shielded to prevent any glare, visible glare on the adjacent residential property. Uh, Stormwater shall flow towards Arendelle rather than back towards the uh, townhome project. Um, a new construction shall require that a privacy fence be installed in addition to the code required landscaping along the adjacent residential properties. Um, the condition specifically reads that when the lot that would now, there's some consideration for a restaurant being done, the, in, the fence would be installed immediately with that new construction. When there was new construction on the adjacent <coughs> lot, which is currently occupied by the auto sales firm, when and if there was a change, that fence uh, would be installed. Um, UDO applicable travel impact, traffic impact fees and any road, impediment, road Im improvement fees that would be required would be calculated uh, and determined by a licensed traffic engineer before final approval by the town staff. Um, and that finally we have asked that, uh, that we consider this to be a mistake when the property was down zoned to residential to and that Mr. Perry has been forced to go to both the time and the expense of returning it to the commercial district or to a commercial district similar to what previously existed, that the administrative zoning fees uh, be waived. Now, the explanation of the mistake, as you, if you, you saw the zoning map, we do border residentially zoned property uh, owned by the church on both the north and also the west side of the property. We believe that when the mapping was done, 
that the property line was misinterpreted and that this property, even though there was already a commercial zone, a commercial building on one of the lots, was mistakenly considered to be a part of the church parcel. And thus the boundary between commercial zoning and commercial development and the residential zoning, which is the church property, was just mistaken. And we think that's how it happened. But regardless of how it happened, uh, it was a down zoning without notice. Uh, we don't think that's good planning policy. Uh, as I said previously, when we adopt a new UDO, we attempt to match up the districts as best we can, and that did not occur in this case. And uh, we respectfully and humbly request that you return this property uh, to the highway commercial zoning district, which is what should have occurred, I believe, and what fairly should have occurred back effective on January the 1st of this year. Uh, Mr. Perry is here. He'd be happy to answer any questions. I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, questions from either board. I feel like this is possibly two separate things that we have going on here. You're asking for a rezoning, and then you are also asking for fees to be returned, correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Okay, so I'm not sure. I'm saying this this is two separate things instead oh, it, of it is it, this is my only chance to, to speak. <laughs> and so yes it is it is two separate things. Okay, this because is my one shot. what were the zoning fees that your client put out? How much did your client spend on zoning fees? To file this particular application? Yes. What is, what's the fee total? Do you, uh, the planning director and the assistant planning director reported $700. Okay. Uh, in other words, it's, that's just a question of fairness in our mind. In other words, uh, it, it down zoning without actual notice to the property owner is just unfair. Uh, if a change is made to one of our traffic laws and I zip through town and violate that law, does that mean that I can say, well, the town didn't notify me? Maybe you want to ask that question of the town attorney, not of me. Eric? It's a completely different matter in a criminal uh, violation of the traffic. I'm just talking about rules in general. You mean in the in the big picture, should we all abide by the rules? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Other questions from either board? Thank you, Mr. Hope. Anyone else wishing to speak in favor of the petition? I know we have uh, some written comments to read. Is there anyone here that wishes to speak in opposition? Take this off, I get it. Yes, sir. As long as you're six feet from somebody, we're good. I'm sorry? As long as you're six feet from someone, we're okay. Okay, very good. Um, my name is Dominic Schilling. I live in Wakeland Townhomes. I'm also the president of the Homeowners Association, and I appreciate the opportunity to come before you guys and uh, speak. Um, I guess. We've had good discussions with Mr. Holt and with Ashley and uh, emails back and forth, and they have been very willing to listen to our concerns and address our concerns. So I would say, you know, we are very pleased with that aspect of things. From my standpoint, as a property owner, but butting right up to the adjacent parcel at 1512 Arendelle, um, my concern all along has been there was a, the, the car sales lot, they're selling trailers, utility type trailers, um, and they were all up and down along Arendelle. Now that that parcel 
is being considered to be developed for a restaurant, apparently, uh, what was going to happen to all those trailers. And that kind of seemed to throw some confusion into things for a little while, but then we were told that the trailers would be moved on to the parcel that is now adjacent to Wakeland townhomes, but they would be kept as far away from the townhomes as possible. That sounds good on paper and in theory, but there's only so much land, and so they are right outside of our backyards. Um, they're somewhat unsightly. Uh, they tend to get moved around several times a week by either fairly heavy-duty diesel pickup trucks or tractors. Uh, they tend to get moved around on Sunday mornings early when the gentleman comes to cut the grass. Um, and so, it, it, in practical fact, they're, they're right out our backyard. Uh, people also come after hours and on weekends to look at the trailers because all they have to do is just kind of park their car in the lot and walk back there. So we have people walking back and forth at various times of day and night. So it poses somewhat of a security concern too because all you have to do is walk from the vacant lot onto our property. Uh, so while we are, at least I am not opposed to the rezoning request, I would definitely like to see the fence extended along the border between the Wakeland townhomes and the two commercial parcels. Um, the fence, as, as I understand it, right now is pro proposed to be between the western side of the property and the north side between the church and the residential on the west. But because the parcel between the restaurant usage and the townhomes is currently not going to be changed, there's no plan to put a fence in place right now. But I would argue that, in fact, the usage has somewhat changed because now there's a bunch of trailers on that vacant piece of land, whereas there was not before. So our, our thought is not that we're opposed to it, but we would like to see the fence as a condition of the rezoning request. Thank you. Uh, question? From either board, by the way. What? Oh, well, I'm, I'm asking for questions of him right now, not someone else to speak. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? <laughs> Tina Binder, and I live in the same community where Dominic Schilling lives, that we back up to um, the property. Um, I'm not as, uh, like he said, we're not opposed, I'm not opposed to it, my family's not opposed to it, but one of the other concerns that has not been mentioned is the smell of restaurant food. The grease, if it's a fried chicken joint or a hamburger joint, you're going to get the french fry grease, the chicken grease. We already smell Bojangles. <laughs> and so um, I, it's just going to add to the smell of the, the neighborhood there, which is, could, during the hot summertime, would be very unpleasant. And that's my only other concern. If some type of filters could be added to the restaurant um, when they do, if it is a fast food restaurant, when they do come in. Um, the other thing was the fence to get it um, installed prior to any change further down the road, but Dominic um, addressed that, so that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? I, I'm not. Okay, we have uh, written comments that have been submitted, uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Stacy to read those. 
I, as a homeowner adjacent to the said property, 1500 and 1512 North Arundel Avenue, do not recommend that a conditional zoning map amendment from heavy commercial to heavy commercial conditional zoning be considered or passed. Why at this point go to heavy, con heavy commercial conditional zoning? so another fast food restaurant can be placed there. We have had numerous accidents in that area that has tied up traffic in both directions. Plus an accident in that area also impacts traffic on Proctor and Pierce's roads with people trying to avoid the backups. Wake Lawn homeowners find it dangerous even getting out of the subdivision when there is an accident in that area plus early morning and evenings. How many accidents have we how many accidents have we had between 64 and Green Pace Road already? Noise is unbelievable in this area now. Homeowners can't even sit on their patios and talk. I know that a traffic light is intended to Green Pace, which will tie up traffic even more during the morning rush hour and evening hours. Early morning and at night, you hear loud banging plus cars and trucks with loud mufflers in front of Sheets, ABC Store, and Bojangles racing up and down Arundel. Wake Lawn residents, along with some Taren Meadows residents, plus the, plus the sum of the Wakefield Baptist Church parishioners, do not need or want more noise and traffic or congestion in this area. There are no sidewalks in that area. I've seen numerous people walking to their jobs daily in that area, which is extremely dangerous. I'm also speaking for a couple of elderly neighbors who do not feel comfortable coming to the meeting and do not have computer access. They also feel that the Zebulon Board will make the right decision to reject this zoning request. If this ordinance is passed and another fast food restaurant comes in that area, the following will affect Wake Lawn homeowners. Resale of Wake Lawn properties will be impacted. Wake Lawn's quality of life will also be affected by noise with drive through speakers on the Wake Lawn side, trucks going in and out with deliveries and pickup of garbage, people will be cutting through our properties at hours trying to get to restaurants. We already put up with when put up with that when Sheets Bojangles and the Waffle House opened. Water runoff might be a problem, no guarantees. Pollution with smell of grease and garbage floating through the air. Thank you for your time, Karen Underhill. That was read verbatim. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? All right, seeing none then, I'm going to uh, refer the matter to the planning board for their recommendation to the town board, uh, which would probably come at the September meeting. Okay, we'll close that public hearing and we will open uh, Judge Street Transportation Plan Amendment. Once again, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the board, as well as members of the planning board. Uh, before you tonight is an amendment to our existing transportation plan, also known as the Town of Zebulon Multimodal Transportation Plan. Um, it is worth noting that this uh, is a text amendment to the current plan. We are in the process of working with consultants to redo our entire transportation plan, but given the scenario of um, of uh, GSK potentially selling some land which we otherwise would have not uh, assumed to be developed um, in any other accordance than with the extension of uh, GSK. Uh, we, we felt that it was uh, best to be proactive to make sure that we have the necessary plans and guidance <coughs> documents in place in the event that that uh, section of land was developed. As such, um, staff is recommending the uh, modification of our transportation plan to uh, list Judd Street from North Arundel to Worth Hinton as a collector street. Um, it is shown here in blue on the map um, as circled um, with the representation that would be a two lane uh, divided uh, road. Um, this would accommodate for appropriate collector street. Um, it is also worth noting that this particular request, um, while this is the standard cross section, 
it would be development specific. So if they're required in certain situations to make a left turn, the median would not be included during that particular segment. But otherwise, the redevelopment of uh, Judd Street would need, would need to be able to accommodate this. Um, part of the rationale for the request is not only in anticipation of GSK being potentially developed, but also the realization that we do not have adequate east-west connectivity. Right now, if somebody wishes to um, connect to, the, uh, to Worth Hinton, they either need to go down to Gannon, uh, uh, down Gannon and then back up Worth Hinton, or all the way up to Green Pace and then back around. This would improve response time for emergency service vehicles, as well as potentially alleviate traffic for some of that residential development that currently lives on Worth Hinton and wishes to shop at um, Triangle East Shopping Center. And with that, I'm available if you have any questions. Question from either board. How would we know if the um, road was going to be uh, town owned or state owned? It said that it there could potentially be either. That's going to be something that we're going to have to work with NCDOT as well as a potential applicant. Um, part of it's going to be dependent upon uh, the Northeast Area Study as well as NCDOT plans. So if it is state owned, does that mean that it's going to be state maintained? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> All right. Will anyone wishing to speak on the matter? Anybody here? Anyway, okay, we'll close the public hearing, refer the matter to the planning board, and we will go to the quarterly text amendments. Okay, the first of the quarterly text amendment is an amendment to section 4.5.4, subsection A of the Unified Development Ordinance. This is the additional standards as it pertains to mobile food vendors. Um, without going through the verbatim of the text, the principle behind it is to uh, make exemptions to the existing application requirement, mainly for uh, vehicles or um, services that are truly transient in nature, um, not just going from one place to set up for an extended period of time, but going uh, on a fixed route primarily, such as an ice cream truck as an example. Um, this uh, partly because those efforts are typically made on a very short basis based on where the driver is going to be located. Um, and we do not have the staff to be able to process permits in such rapid succession every time that an applicant wishes to come out. The application or the text amendment also allows for an exemption for town sponsored events as well as HOA sponsored events. If a, t a food truck or a trailer were to locate within an HOA common area, such as an amenity center, this um, alleviates the uh, uh, town from having to go through and process that particular requirement. This would still pertain to, um, let's say, if a food truck wanted to set up on a rental or uh, within a commercial operation for an extended period of time, we would work with that uh, potential applicant uh, regarding the um, process to acquire the uh, mobile food vendors permit. Question? And what is your definition of an ice cream truck? Is that based upon sales or can a food truck selling ice cream declare themselves an ice cream truck? It would be, ice cream truck was just an example. It'd be a vehicle that is not going to a set location as opposed to a desired route. Um, such as an ice cream where they stay, they stop based on point of contact sales um, that are representative, such as folks gathering outside where they may pull up, provide services to those folks that are on site at that moment in time, and then continue on their fixed route. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Mike. Huh? One more. Okay. No, one more text from I understand. <laughs> I got it. All right, go ahead with it then. Okay, the final of the quarterly text amendments is an uh, amendment to section 6.10.7, subsection F. Um, when we were preparing the uh, Unified Development Orders, one of the things that unfortunately was uh, not noted by staff was it included uh, very specific grade requirements in terms of percentages for uh, street or um, new streets, 
And unfortunately, they were different than our standard specification manuals. The standard specification manuals uh, were based on NCDOT guidelines. Additionally, all of our um, uh, public works equipment, such as plow trucks um, and other uh, equipment, is set based on those intended grades. And the proposed grades, um, as listed in the UDO, actually allowed for much steeper pitches um, to several of the streets. Therefore, uh, the town staff is recommending a modification of that section to eliminate the chart um, that lists those grades and instead reference um, that the applicant needs to follow the standard specification manual um, that is uh, currently being maintained by a public works department. And this is uh, an example of the, um, the manual that the public works department used with an engineer to come up with the calculations for the town grade. This is provided by a public works director. Okay, question? Anyone wishing to speak? Okay, we'll close the public hearing, refer those two matters to the planning board as well. And they will in turn make their recommendations back to us. So is there a motion to adjourn? Motion. So moved. Second. Second. I got two motions, so <laughs> just I don't care. Second. <laughs> one. All right. All in favor. Well, we don't need it. That's all right. We're we're adjourned. <laughs> Headaches and <in the> <laughs>